Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to our third session on the tafsir of Surat Fatir. And I'd also like to extend my warmest greetings to all of you as we begin the month of the sacred month of the uh, Hijjah. And on this day, the, the first of the Hijjah, it's a, it's a particularly blessed day because we have narrations that mention that it is the day <clears throat> that Ibrahim alayhi salam, the great prophet, the patriarch of Allah's prophets and messengers was born. And it also is the anniversary of the, the blessed marriage, the blessed wedding of Amir al-Mu'mineen and Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam. So we thank Allah Azza wa Jal for giving us the tawfiq to come together on this blessed day and, and do the best thing. And that is to reflect and to ponder over uh, some verses of the Holy Quran. So with that said, uh, inshallah, we'll continue our discussion where we left off. And uh, I believe we left off at, uh, at verse number three. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. يا أيها الناس اذكروا نعمة الله عليكم هل من خالق غير الله يرزقكم من السماء والأرض لا إله إلا هو فأنا تؤفكون O mankind, remember God's blessings upon you. Is there a creator other than God who provides you from the heaven and earth? There is no God but he. How then are you perverted? Now, <clears throat> in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not addressing a particular group. You know, there are some Quranic verses where the primary audience is the believers, for example. When Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amin, O you who believe. Some verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet or he addresses Bani Israel, or he addresses Ahlul Kitab in general, or he addresses the Munafiqeen. But in this verse, the address is universal. Ya ayyuhan nas, O people, O human being. So the message that follows obviously has to be something that can be universally understood and recognized. And the invitation is to remember, to ponder, to reflect on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings. Now, there are six verses in the Qur'an where we are invited to recall, to remember God's blessings. And I have uh, them listed here. Now, of course, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, remember, ya nas, alaykum, remember the blessings of God, the, the purpose of this instruction is not for us to actually enumerate them and, and to thank and express gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that is commensurate with His, his grace. Because as we know from many verses in the Quran, God's blessings, the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us are, are incalculable. They're innumerable. In Surah Ibrahim, ayah number 34, we read, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا That if you try, if you attempt to enumerate, to count, the blessings of Allah, you will never enumerate them. And in fact, it's not blessings. It's, it's singular. If you try to, to calculate and to fathom how much there is in one blessing, you know, you think of the ni'mah of eyesight, the blessing of eyesight. But within this one ni'mah, it seems that there are infinite blessings. There are so many things that Allah has given us, so many things that He has created, so many structures that He has engineered for us to be able to see. So indeed, in every blessing, 
there is an infinite number of blessings. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, there is also mention of apparent blessings and unseen blessings. So obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he invites us to remember his blessings, you know, we're not able to remember blessings that we're not aware of. But this is to show us how widespread, how great Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's favor, uh, how great his favor is upon us. In Surah uh, Luqman, we read, أَلَمْ تَرَوْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ سَخَّرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Have you not seen that God has made all that is in the heavens and the earth subservient to you? Don't you see that this planet is, is fine-tuned for your comfort, that everything that you need is at your disposal. Allah has enabled us to, to benefit from the earth, from the heavens, to derive everything that we need. All the resources are available to us. Have you not seen that God has made all that is in the heavens and the earth subservient to you? So it seems from this verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything in the universe for the human being, for, for, the, for insan. Now we might not understand the role that these different creatures have in, in the life of man, but nonetheless the Quran mentions that everything has been made subservient to you. وَأَسْبَغَ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعَمَهُ ظَاهِرَةً وَبَاطِنًا And he has amply bestowed upon you his apparent and unseen bounties. نِعَمَهُ ظَاهِرَةً وَبَاطِنًا Those that are evident, those that are apparent, and those that are hidden. There are so many things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has that there are so many blessings that he has bestowed upon us that are hidden, that are concealed from us. You know, oftentimes we only think about the apparent blessings, but there are blessings that we're not even aware of. You know, even if you think about the relationship between a parent and a child, you know, the child, for example, sees that, you know, you buy them clothes or you feed them or you take them you know, out to the park for enjoyment. But this child is not aware of all of the other things that the parent does uh, for them. You know, they don't know that, for example, this parent is setting aside money for them in the future. They don't know that, you know, this, this parent is paying bills to keep the lights on. You know, kids are not even aware of all of the things that their parents do for them. And this is similar to our relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal. We're only aware of a few of the blessings that he has bestowed upon us. There are so many more favors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has conferred upon us that we're, we're ignorant of because they are unseen, because they are concealed from us, because we don't have the knowledge of them. Now, going back to the verse, if we go back to the, the ayah, Ya أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ اذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ O oh, mankind, remember God's blessings upon you. And why, why, why are we asked, why are we instructed to remember God's blessings? It's because when you remember the infinite mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you remember his blessings, it engenders love in the heart for him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to love him. He wants you to come close to him because through proximity to him, you will attain that, that happiness and that joy and that tranquility. So remembering God's blessings is really meant to engender love in our hearts, to bring us closer to Him. Not because He needs us. Allah is needless. He's self-sufficient. But because we need Him in order to attain and reach the goal the purpose of our creation, we have, to, we have to move towards Him. Now, in this verse, there are two blessings that are mentioned. 
So the verse says, Ya ayyuhan nasu dhkuru ni'matallahi alaykum. Hal min khaliqin ghayru Allah yarzuqukum min as-sama'i wal-ard. So in this verse, so there is an invitation. We're enjoined to remember the blessings of God. Now in this verse, some of the mufassireen, they note that this verse points to two general categories of Allah's blessings. The first is the blessing of creation. The fact that he brought you into existence. You didn't exist and now you exist. This in and of itself is a ni'mah. So this is what they call ni'matul ijad. The blessing of coming into existence. And this is what is alluded to when the verse says, هَلْ مِنْ خَالِقٍ غَيْرُ اللَّهِ Is there a creator other than God? Meaning, is there anyone else who gave you the gift of existence? So that's, that's the first category. And the second category of divine blessings is the blessing of perpetuation. نِعْمَةُ ibqa. So it's not only that Allah brought you into existence, after bringing you into existence, He sustains you. He provides for you. He nourishes you. So this is this is a separate blessing. You know, there, you know, not every not every creator is a caretaker. Right? You know, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when if you go back to if we go back to the verse, Hel min khaliqin ghayrullah, a reference to ni'matul ijad, the, the blessing of coming into existence. Yarzuqukum min as samai wal arv who provides you from heaven and the earth, ni'matul ibqa, that he, he sustains you, he nourishes you, he provides for you. So these scholars, they interpret, as I mentioned, هَلْ مِنْ خَالِقٍ غَيْرُ اللَّهِ Is there a creator other than God? They say that this is a reference to ni'matul ijad. This is a reference to the blessing of creation and existence. And the phrase, يَرْزُقُكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ They say this is a reference to نِعْمَةُ الْإِبْقَى The blessing of perpetuation. That he provides for you physical nourishment, spiritual nourishment in the form of guidance. And, and even existence itself. We, we need Allah to come into existence and we need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue existing. So this, there has to be this, this constant giving. Allah has to bestow existence upon us at every single moment because we are what? We're contingent beings. We're mumkinul wujud. Our existence is not inherent. It was acquired from, from another, from an, from, a, from, an ex, from an external being. Because at one time we didn't exist and now we exist. So we derived existence from an outside source. So we are contingent. So a contingent being at every moment needs to be supplied with existence from wajibul wujud, from the necessary existence. That being whose nature is to exist, who exists in and of, its, in and of himself. Now, in this context, so if we go back to the, the ayah, La ilaha illahu. So, Ya ayyuhan nas, uthkuru ni'matallahi alaykum, O mankind, remember God's blessings upon you. Hal min khaliqin ghayrullah, is there a creator other than God? A reference to the, the blessing of existence, ni'matul ijad. Yarzuqukum min as sama'i wal ard, who provides for you from the heaven and from the earth, ni'matul ibqa, the blessing of perpetuation. La ilaha illa ant. There is no God but He. Now, in this context, la ilaha illahu, there is no God but Him, highlights that only because an ilah is a being that is worthy of worship, that is worthy of reverence and adoration. So, La ilaha illahu 
highlights that only the one who creates, who gives you existence and sustains your existence is worthy of your adoration, your obedience and your love and your worship. So there is no ilah, there is no being worthy of worship other than Allah because Allah created everything and he sustains everything. Therefore, the only being that is worthy of, of your worship is a being who has that ability. So since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided us all of these blessings, especially those two categories of blessings, how can anyone turn away from him and ascribe partners to him? In fact, anything that you try to worship other than him was created by him and is sustained by him. La ilaha illahu. There is, there is no ilah other than him. There's no being that's worthy of worship. And the word ilah also means refuge. There is no refuge other than him. Because nothing has the ability to exist on its own. Everything that exists is an extension of him, is a shadow of his existence. So why, why would you turn to anyone other than him? Why would you worship anyone other than him? Why invoke anyone other than him? Now, tu'fakun. So, again, if we go back to the verse, tu'fakun. How then are you perverted? Tu'fakun means perverted or deluded. Now, what is the meaning of tu'fakun? It comes from the root word ifk. Ifk is basically a lie or a fabrication, but it re it refers, you know, from a linguistic perspective, it refers to the act of turning turning towards something that has no reality. You know, and that's essentially what a lie is. When you tell a lie, you're turning people's attention to something that doesn't have a reality and you're turning them away from what is real. So when Allah says there is no ilah other than me, Shirk is essentially to turn towards something that has no reality. It's not real. It's not, it's not something that, that has any power to grant you what you're seeking. It's like, it's like running after a mirage. It looks appealing, but, there, but it has no reality. It's like a thirsty person who's running towards a mirage, thinking that it's water. So fa'anna tu'fakun refers to the act of turning towards something that has no reality. And this in and of itself is, is a type of suffering. You know, to and, and this is and this this is why shirk is very painful in the hereafter, because it's the it's in the hereafter we will see the physical manifestation of what it means to be away from God. You know that that anxiety that you feel when you're when you're lost, that that pain is something that will be felt, especially in uh, the hereafter. So tufakun refers to the act of turning towards something that has no reality. It's basically a lie or a fabrication. It also means to perpetuate or adopt a a falsehood. Now. Very quickly, I wanted to uh, mention, uh, I wanted to cite uh, these, these three verses from Surah Al-Waqi'ah. Because I think, you know, sometimes we, we, take, we take it for granted. We take Allah's power for granted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, verses 57 to 59, what does he say? نَحْنُ خَلَقْنَاكُمْ we created you. If, you. if only you would believe it. If only you would affirm it. You know, we've become so accustomed to witnessing the miracle of life that we take it for granted. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Have you considered that which you emit? That which you emit is a reference to the males that they emit the the sperm or the semen 
I mean, just think about this for a moment, brothers and sisters. That we began, every single one of us began as a single cell. A single cell. And I, I encourage you, brothers and sisters, tonight, if you can, go on, on YouTube and just type in fetal development. The development of a fetus in the womb. They have these elaborate videos that show you the journey of every human being from being a single cell, single sperm cell, to a fully fashioned fetus. And it's a miracle. It's as though you are looking at a factory that has been programmed to produce a human being. The, the division of cells, the specialization of the cells is something that we take for granted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Don't you see what you emit? You emit this liquid which is made up of trillions of sperm cells and one of them fertilizes an egg and in nine months you have a complete human being. Do you and I, you and I have nothing to do with it. After the fertilization of the egg, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes control of everything. You know, we just wait while Allah Azza wa Jal is fashioning this, this fetus. Is it you who created it? Or are we the creators? You know, if I show you a robot that that talks and that moves and has intelligence your first question would be you know who makes this what's the company what who's the manufacturer you know this is intuitive we know that something like that cannot be produced through chance so allah says is it you who created it or are we the creators so it's something for us uh, to reflect on verse number four so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the previous verse invites us to remember his blessings, particularly the blessings of existence and perpetuation that Allah sustains us. And one of the most important blessings is the blessing of guidance. When we spoke about ni'matul ibqa, the, the blessing of perpetuation that he provides for us, he sustains us. The mo one of the most important sustenance that Allah gives us is that He doesn't leave us astray. He guides us. And here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns to the, the concept of sending messengers. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not left us to ourselves. And here, the ayah says, وَإِيُّكَذِّبُوكَ فَقَدْ كُذِّبَتْ رُسُلٌ مِّنْ قَبْلِكَ and if they reject you, O Muhammad, if they reject you, other messengers had certainly been rejected before you. And to God return all matters. Now, if you remember, we said Surah Fatir is a, a Meccan Surah. It is of a surah that is revealed in the middle of the Meccan period, shortly after the Prophet uh, began publicly propagating his message. So at this stage in the Prophet's mission, he's beginning to face fierce opposition. You know, in the beginning, Quraysh didn't take Islam seriously. The Muslims were this were this small group, this religious cult that was made up of you know the the downtrodden the disenfranchised a few slaves a few women some youth and they thought that this is just you know a trend that will fizzle out after some time but as the prophet sallallahu began as his movement began to grow and some prominent people in Quraysh joined his ranks this is when you see that the, the resistance and the opposition intensifies. So this opposition that he faces very early on comes in the form of ridicule. 
and he starts to get ridiculed by some of his closest family members, you know, his own his own uncle, for example, his uncle Abu Talib. So they, they engage in character assassination, they slander him, they call him a magician, they say he's a madman, and so on and so forth. And even they result to, to physical assault. Now, you can imagine how difficult this is. You know, before the Prophet begins his mission, you know, he was highly respected. He was known as a Sadiq al Amin. And for these same people, his own people, his own tribe, to turn against him and to ridicule him and to mock him and to torment him, it was difficult. Now, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reveals this verse as a way of, it, it serves to console the prophet. The denial and persecution of previous prophets serves to console the prophet. That Ya Rasulullah, you're not the first messenger to be mocked. You're not the first messenger to be ridiculed, to be tormented, to be physically assaulted. You know, Nuh salam was stoned. He was physically stoned. So a lot of, many messengers were physically assaulted. And in fact, the Quran here in Surah Al-Hijr, verse 11, Allah says, وَمَا يَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ And no messenger would come to them except that they ridiculed him. Now some prophets, many prophets, and messengers were killed. Many of them were killed. Many of them were martyred. So out of 124,000 prophets, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that at least half of them were probably killed. But this ayah here, So some prophets were killed, but all prophets were mocked and ridiculed without exception. And this is something that's shocking. That there is not a single prophet who was not verbally abused. And sometimes, you know, the verbal abuse is even more painful than the physical abuse. To have your dignity called, be called into question, to be called a liar, to be called, you know, an insane person. It's painful. You know, at the end of the day, prophets are, are human beings. So the Quran says that all prophets, without exception, they were, they were mocked. They were ridiculed by their people. Now, how did the prophets respond to this abuse? So they're being, they're being ridiculed, they're being tormented, they're being abused. Allah says in Surah Al-An'am, ayah number 34, min qablik. They were, and certainly messengers before you were rejected. فَصَبَرُوا عَلَى مَا كُذِّبُوا وَأُوذُوا حَتَّى أَتَاهُمْ نَصْرُنَا but they were patient. They understood that this is a difficult mission. They didn't take things personally because they understood their role. Their role was to deliver the message, to serve as moral exemplars. So they responded to this abuse with patience. They didn't give up on their communities. They were patient. And they were persecuted until our help came to them. Until our help came to them. They were resilient. They endured. Now, from a Quranic perspective, from a Quranic perspective, not from a worldly perspective, from a Quranic perspective, all prophetic missions are ultimately victorious. Even those prophets who were killed by their people. You, we can't say that they failed. None of the prophets failed because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he says, that without a doubt, me and my messengers will prevail. We will be victorious. This is a divine promise. So Yahya bin Zakariya killed, but he was victorious. Nuh, Lut, Ibrahim, all of the prophets, they are ultimately victorious. Not And not just in the sense that in the hereafter, they'll be rewarded. No, 
they are victorious even in this life. Why? All prophetic missions are ultimately victorious from a Quranic perspective because each prophet played a role in preserving the truth and exposing falsehood. So even if there's a prophet that Allah sent to a remote village, just preserving the truth in that village and exposing falsehood, this all this, this was their mission. So they, they succeeded. And then ultimately, of course, the culmination of all of their efforts will be realized the, with the zuhur of the 12th imam. And the 12th imam, of course, this will be the culmination of, of, all, of all of these efforts. But the, the final victory will be witnessed by uh, the 12th imam, alayhi salam. وَإِذَا اللَّهِ تُرْجَعُ الْأُمُورِ So Allah consoles the Prophet really with two things. There are two important messages here. Number one, what you're going through is not something that is unique. You know, sometimes when we have problems, we think that we're the only ones who are suffering. That don't let your suffering make you feel isolated. Ya Rasulullah, you're in good company. This is what happened to this is what happened to Nuh, to Ibrahim, to Musa. Musa suffered greatly to Yusuf. Yusuf was betrayed by his family. So Allah consoles the Prophet. Ya Rasulullah, be patient. Don't be too bothered. Don't be too disappointed. Don't let it get the best of you. Be patient and endure. Because you are experiencing what other messengers experienced. This is number one. And more importantly, وَإِلَى اللَّهِ تُرْجَعُ الْأُمُورِ And to God return all matters. What does this mean? It means that Allah is aware of your suffering. He's aware of the suffering of the believers. Everything is going to go back to Allah. This is a case that will be presented before Allah. So Allah knows about the suffering of the messenger and the believers, and he knows about the transgression of the opponents of his message. It's all going to go back. We're all going to stand before that judge, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any arguments, any disputes about what is the truth, all of this will be settled. God will settle all disputes. Allah will tell us about all of our ikhtilaf, the truth will be revealed. He will re reward the believers through His grace. That your efforts are not going to go in vain. And the crimes of those who persecuted you and oppress you will not go unpunished. So basically the message here is what? That there is something on the other side. Don't think that this life is all that there is. And those who die escape justice. And, you know, the believers who, who pass away, they're, they're just victims and that's the end of it. Everything will be, everything goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The judgments, the rewards, and the punishments. Now, it's very appropriate here. I mean, if you, the, the flow of the verses is uh, the flow of the verses is, is quite beautiful and it's uh, it's not random there's everything is connected here so Allah mentioned you know وَإِلَى اللَّهِ تُرْجَعُ الْأُمُورِ a reference to the, the hereafter and Allah warns us يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنَّ وَعْدَ اللَّهِ حَقٌ O mankind indeed the promise of God is truth فَلَا تَغُرَّنَّكُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا Oh mankind, indeed the promise of God is truth. So let not the worldly life delude you and be not deceived about God by the deceiver. So the, pre the end of the previous verse spoke about that everything is going back to God. So there's life after death. There's accountability after death. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us 
how to prepare for that hereafter. That don't slip, don't drown in this world of dunya. So number one, Ya ayyuhan nas, inna wa'adallahi haq. The promise of God is true. Now, what is the promise of God? Some of the mufassirin, they say, if you look at the siyaq, if you look at the context, especially the previous verse where Allah was consoling the Prophet because of the, the oppression that he was facing, some mufassirin say that the promise of God is a reference to the, the promise of divine punishment for those who harass the Prophet, for those who disbelieve. However, other scholars, and this seems to be the stronger opinion, is that there's no reason to, to limit it to only punishment. The more likely opinion is that it refers to all the events pertaining to the hereafter. So the promise of Allah is what? The promise of hisab, the promise of riqab, the promise of thawab, all of this, the day of reckoning, the reward, the punishment, hellfire, paradise. So when Allah says the promise of God is true, in haq, it means that there's more to your existence than this world. This is the divine promise. This is merely one phase in, uh, in your journey. Now this verse warns people not to be deceived by two things. So we go back to the ayah. فَلَا تَغُرَّنَّكُمْ تَغُرَّنَّكُمْ From the word غُرُور means to be deceived or deluded. Don't be deluded by two things. The first is dunya, so the two Ds really. Don't be deceived. Don't be deluded by dunya and don't be deluded by the devil. So dunya and devil. Now, what does this mean? So the verse warns us about two things. Number one, don't be deceived by the allurements of this earthly life. So this is an external allurement. And the second is, don't be deluded by shaitan, al-gharur, the deceiver. Don't let him use God to deceive you. You know, shaitan is very sophisticated. Shaitan sometimes uses dunya to make you go astray. And sometimes he uses Allah. He uses Allah to his advantage. He uses God to deceive you. Now, how is that? So well, let's begin with dunya and then we'll speak about how shaitan uses God to lead people astray. Now, when it comes to, to dunya, again, we reiterate that when we say that we have to be beware of dunya, that doesn't mean that you, you withdraw yourself from society and you live in isolation. What we're talking about is really an attitude. What should be your attitude towards this life? We're speaking about attachment, obsession. So a person, and you know, as they say, you know, you can live in the dunya, but don't let the dunya live in you. Don't make don't make it your number one priority. The acquisition of material, you know, uh, the material objects should not be, you know, your your ultimate goal in life. Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi alayhi he says, "Ihdaru dunya, beware." Of dunya, beware of this earthly life. فَإِنَّ فِي حَلَالِهَا حِسَابٌ وَفِي حَرَامِهَا عِقَابٌ Such a profound statement. The Imam says, beware of dunya, for verily with regards to its lawful things, there is accountability. You know, Allah will question us about everything. So there is hisab even when it comes to halal. Allah wants to know the motivation Behind everything that we've done. There is hisab when it comes to the halal. وَفِي حَرَامِهَا عِقَابٌ and, and with regards to its unlawful things, there is punishment. The more you take of dunya, you know, the longer your, your reckoning will be. You know, there's an, an analogy that I believe Imam al-Sadiq gives. Where he says that, you know, if, if you imagine two ships trying to cross a checkpoint, a port. 
if the ship is empty, it passes very quickly because the inspection is very quick if it's an empty vessel. But if it's a ship with a lot of goods and merchandise, even if all of it is legit and it's been legally purchased and you have receipts, it's still going to take time because, because that's what in, the inspection is going to entail. So, and this is why Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, when he was on his deathbed and his daughter, Um Kulthum, brought him his iftar and she brought, you know, yogurt and, and bread and, uh, you know, some salt. The Imam alayhi salam, he says to her, أَتُرِيدِينَ أَنْ يَطُولَ وَقُوفِ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَ Oh, my daughter, why are you doing this to me? Do you want my standing before Allah to be prolonged on the Day of Judgment? The more you take from dunya, the longer the accounting, the longer the reckoning. So the Imam is saying that why are you, why are you so attached to a life where with regard to its lawful, there's accountability and with regards to its unlawful, there's punishment. Its beginning is hardship. You have to work hard to establish yourself, to earn a living, to provide for your family. It's, it's a struggle. And even if you have money, you have to struggle to protect it. You have to protect yourself from thieves, from people who are trying to manipulate you. It's difficult. It's tiring. And after all of this, you die. So why, why attach your heart to a world where there is accountability when it comes to its halal and there is punishment if you partake in haram, it's difficult, meaning that its, it's beginning is hardship and its end is annihilation. So the imam is saying that don't let your heart get attached to it. In, a, in another tradition from Imam al-Kadhim, he says, مَثَلُ الدُّنْيَا مَثَلُ مَا الْبَحْرِ this dunya, the parable of this life, this world, is that of seawater. كُلَّمَا شَرِبَ مِنْهُ الْعَطْشَانِ ازداد عَطَشًا حَتَّى يَقْتُلًا However much the thirsty man drinks from it, his thirst intensifies until it kills him. This is the reality of dunya. You know, it reminds me of the the narration of Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam that if the son of Adam, if the human being was given two valleys of gold and silver, he will go and search for the third. He will never be satiated. Why? Because the heart can only be satiated by something that is unending and infinite. And the only infinite thing is Allah. So that's why dunya is never going to be able to quench your thirst. Because dunya is inherently limited. And the human heart craves the unlimited. And the only unlimited is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here's a very beautiful tradition from Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam where he says, تَمَثَّلَتِ الدُّنْيَا Masih alayhi salam That dunya, the world was embodied to Jesus so dunya took on a physical form. The reality of dunya assumed an image in front of Jesus, in front of Isa alayhi salam. And what was that image? A blue-eyed woman, of an attractive uh, image. في صورة, في صورة زرقاء, a blue-eyed woman. You know, this, typically this is seen to be, you know, a symbol of beauty. فَقَالَ لَهَا so Isa alayhi salam, he asks, he asks her, and this is this being is the physical representation of dunya. Kam tazawajti? How many have you married? Faqalat kathira. She says, I have married many. So Isa alayhi salam says, Fakullun talakuki. So all of them divorced you. قالت لا بل كلا قتلت. She said no. Rather, I killed all of them. Anyone who had a relationship with me, I killed him. This is dunya speaking. 
قال المسيح عليه السلام عيسى عليه السلام when he hears this that anyone who tries to forge a relationship a marriage to dunya it kills him فويح لأزواجك الباقين كيف لا يعتبرون بالماضين so عيسى عليه السلام he says woe be upon your current spouses for how do they not take a lesson from your previous ones imagine imagine if you're if you're single, if you're a bachelor, and you're introduced to a young lady who's very beautiful, very attractive, but you found out that she was previously married to 50 people and she murdered all of them. Would you would you get married to such a woman? You wouldn't. You would stay away because you know you know her track record. Look at the track record of dunya. Anyone who gave their heart to this life, perished. So we have to take lesson, brothers and sisters. We have to take lesson. And subhanAllah, you know, many people, like I mean, you, you, you take the likes of Nimrud and Fir'aun and Muawi and others, they married the dunya. They married the dunya. They indulged in the dunya. And then you have Ali ibn Abi Talib. Who says, Ya dunya ghurri ghayri, qad talaqtuki thalatha. Imam says to the dunya, go deceive someone else, because I know your reality. I have divorced you three times. Ali divorced the dunya three times. And many of those around him, they wedded themselves to the dunya. And where are they now? They left. So this is the first part of the ayah. So when we go back to the verse, فَلَا تَغُرَّنَّكُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا Do not be deceived by this earthly life. وَلَا يَغُرَّنَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ And do not be deceived about God by the deceiver. غَرُورِ Here is shaitan. Don't let shaitan deceive you by, by using God. Now what does this mean? It means don't allow your belief in Allah's mercy to embolden you to sin. You know, sometimes shaitan comes to you and says, Allah is merciful. Do you think Allah is going to punish you for eating a hamburger? It's just a handshake. It was just a hug. It was just one sip of alcohol. Allah is so merciful. You know, repent. He'll accept your repentance later when you go to Hajj or when you go on Ziyarah. <laughs> this is how shaitan uses God to delude you. He reminds you of his mercy and says to you that I'll repent later, that God is too merciful to punish you. You know, sometimes we hear people say this. They say God is love and he's mercy, but they forget that Allah subhanahu wa Allah is also shadid al-iqab. Allah is also severe in, in retribution. So it is in the same way that it is a sin to lose hope in Allah's mercy, it is a sin to feel secure from his punishment. This is also haram. In Surah Al-A'raf, verse 99, you know, one of the kabbalah, this is a major sin. It's a major sin to say Allah will never forgive me. That's a major sin. It's a major sin also to say that Allah will never punish me because he's so merciful. Both are haram. So in Surah Al-A'raf, ayah number 99, Allah says that do they consider themselves secure from the retribution of God? No one can have such an attitude. No one can feel secure from God's ret ret uh, retribution except those who are who are lost. And I'll conclude with uh, with this, this narration from Imam al-Sadiq, and inshallah we'll continue our discussion next week. This hadith is beautiful. This hadith, believe me, I think a, a narration like this can only come from a ma'asun. Only Ahlul Bayt can speak like this. Imam al-Sadiq, alayhi salam, he says, Urju Allah raja'an la yajurruka ila ma'asi." Hope in God with a hope that does not pull you towards his 
disobedience. And fear God, fear Allah, with a fear that does not make you forget His mercy. So there needs to be balance. We have to have hope and fear. So in this ayah, Allah says, O mankind, Ya ayyuhan nas, inna wa'adallahi haq. The promise of God is true. There is accountability in the hereafter. Don't let the dunya deceive you. And don't let the devil deceive you by telling you that I'm merciful and do whatever you want and I'll never punish you. We have to have this balance of hope and fear. With that, inshallah, we'll end our session for today. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa ala ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad if there are any questions or comments, I think we had uh, a couple of questions from last week. So maybe I'll begin with those. So the question last week that was posed was about the difference between uh, Faliq and Fatir. So Falaqa and Fatara. Now, Falaqa, Faliq means to split. Allah, you know, in some of the supplications, He's Faliq al Habbi wa Nawa. He is the splitter of the seed and the nut means to split and it means to split something that exists falaq is usually used in reference to something that is created and has been split whereas fatir it also means to split but it also carries the added meaning of originating something bringing something into existence meaning splitting it from non-existence into existence so fatra has this meaning of origin, bringing something into existence after it was preceded by non-existence. So that was a question from uh, from last week, and I, I don't remember what the the other one was at the moment. Any other questions or comments? So uh, just as an example of fatr, would that be say a child being born? Is that more like fatr? So yeah, a child being born, if you you could you could refer to the the splitting of the the cells, for example, as as uh, as falaqa, right? But fa you mean you, you meant father for uh, for a child being born? Yeah, yes, father. As I said, they can be synonymous. They can be used as as synonyms, but but you can't say that you know Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. You can't use the, you can't say falaqa uh, uh, to mean that he created the heavens and the earth, but fatara can mean to bring something into existence. But but uh, but but falaqa uh, doesn't carry that meaning. Yeah, thank you. And um, in the previous verse, and in, in, when you talk about shaitan deceiving us, uh, what are some of the ways that shaitan deceives us about God other than having too much reliance on His mercy? You know, an another way that he can deceive you is, is the opposite, right? So he can deceive you by telling you that, you know, God doesn't accept you, that you are too polluted, you are too sinful to be, uh, to be forgiven, that, you know, you, you've committed too many crimes for you to attain salvation. So he can use God to... Uh, to basically say to you that you've drifted too far away for you to come back, or he can use uh, use his mercy as a tool to delude you. Thank you, Sheikh. And then verse four, uh, when it talks about all the prophets were being mocked and ridiculed, could you talk about how this applied to Prophet Yusuf? Because it doesn't seem like his abuses stem from his prophethood. It doesn't seem that his abuses stem from so so when you look at uh, his his abuses definitely stem from the fact that he was a prophet. I mean, this is why if you look at Yaqub, his father, the reason why he loved him so dearly was because you know uh, because he was chosen by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and he was you know his uh, he was he he would, he would be the one to succeed him. And this is what made the uh, the brothers jealous 
So the fact that Nubuwa was given to him and his father showed him great love and great respect and affection, you know, this is what really made them uh, jealous. So everything that happened to him was actually a result of uh, the affection and the love that he was shown uh, by his father as a result of him being being purified and chosen by Allah. Uh, interesting. Thank you. And in uh, verse 3, yeah, in, in verse 3, it, it's kind of interesting that over here it has the heaven is used in the singular form instead of plural, instead of saying heaven and the earth that you're getting the blessings from. Uh, could you just talk about that a little bit? Your question is about verse number three, that sama is singular and not plural? Because normally it's referred, Quran refers to the heavens in, in plural form. Over here it's yeah. in singular form. So that's an excellent question. Now, because the verse is speaking about rizq, about sustenance, we don't receive sustenance, at least in a direct way, from the higher heavens. You know, the most obvious example of us receiving sustenance from as sama is rain, right? So because our sustenance is closely tied to the sama, to the sky, or to the sama ud dunya, it seems that in this context, it would be more appropriate. It's appropriate to mention it in the singular because our sustenance comes directly from uh, sama. And here, sama seems to mean the sky. It seems that it, the verse is uh, referring to, uh, to rain because it's the most direct uh, form of sustenance that comes from the sky. And this is also something that we take for granted. You know, with all of our technology, we don't have the power to make it rain. We don't have machines that can form clouds and and uh, and pour rain. So even though we've advanced a great deal technologically, we don't have the power to generate rainfall. So this is also another reminder of of uh, the power of Allah and the blessings that He that He grants us that we're not we're not able to to replicate them. Yes, uh, rain, sunlight. Rain, sunlight, and even if we, I mean, the amount of rain, you know, only Allah knows how many droplets actually fall from the sky. You know, a meteorologist can maybe tell you if it's going to rain or not, but there's no, there's no super com computer. There's nothing that can calculate, you know, the amount of raindrops or the amount of leaves that fall from the tree, which, which uh, fertilize the, uh, the earth and, and provide nourishment for other insects and creatures. This is only only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has this knowledge. Yes, and uh, the six verses that you mentioned where people are encouraged to remember Allah's blessings, is there any uh, common theme bef between those verses and, and the blessings that they talk about? So in these verses, some of them address the Israelites, Bani Israel, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is is inviting them to remember God's blessings specific to them. But uh, I don't know. I would have to look at these verses more closely to uh, to find a common theme. I mean, the common theme is, you know, uh, thinking and reflecting on, on God's blessings. But uh, I know for sure that the, the addressees in these verses are not the same. Some of them address uh, mankind. Others address... Uh, the, the Israel, Bani Israel, and maybe there are some other uh, uh, groups that are addressed, but uh, I would have to look at the verses more carefully. Okay, you've given him the thing. He's asked for something else. Yeah. Yeah, Sheikh, thank you very much, Sheikh. Jazakumullah. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share. The, the little that I have to offer, you know, I sometimes I feel like, you know, the Quran is this endless ocean and just sprinkling a few, few drops and, and subhanAllah, even these few drops keep us busy reflecting and thinking. And uh, I, I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to allow us to draw a few more drops as we continue. And inshallah, even a few drops makes a lot of difference to a dry piece of land or parchment. I sent them, I sent them, very true. Thank you so much. Please keep me in your du'a and inshallah we will reconvene uh, next week. Uh, Take care. And, uh, Thank you very much, Sheikh. My salam to your family and please take very good care of yourself.
Inshallah, you're always in our du'as. Jazakum. Thank we look you. forward to every Wednesday. And we can't wait for 6.30. Allah bless you, inshallah. Please make du'a for me during these uh, 10 days of the Hijjah. I would appreciate inshallah. if I can be included in your du'a. Likewise, Shaykh. Likewise. Jazakum Allah.